Okay. Well, thank you all for coming to day three. It's my pleasure to, uh, to introduce again, Sasha Kuznetsov, who's going to talk about constructions of exceptional collections. Uh, thank you very much. So um, uh, let us consider the uh, situation that we described yesterday. So that will be a compact homogeneous variety of a simple algebraic group. Uh, so this is G of P, P is a parabolic subgroup. And I will assume that G is uh, simply connected. So I already explained yesterday why this is useful, but uh, let me just remember. Uh, so uh, the important uh, statement here is a theorem by uh, Sasha Polishuk. Uh, which states that uh, if under these assumptions, if P is an exceptional object in D of X, then it is uh, G equivalent. So uh, this will be the most important observation for, for the constructions we are going to discuss today. So uh, how this could be used? Uh, in fact, this could be used quite directly because uh, there is a very nice description of uh, uh, G equivalent coherent sheets and more generally of G equivalent uh, derived category of a homogeneous variety. So, uh, this is a general fact uh, that uh, the G equivalent, uh, the category of G equivalent coherent sheets on G mod P, uh, maybe let me write G mod P to stress this, uh, is equivalent to the category of representations of the group P. And uh, uh, moreover, this is uh, an exact equivalence of uh, monoidal abelian categories. And uh, it induces an equivalence of the corresponding triangulated categories. So the G equivalent uh, derived category of G mod P is equivalent to the derived category of the category of representations of this parabolic group P. Uh, and uh, it is also monoidal. Uh, monoidal means that it, it is compatible, uh, it preserves uh, the natural uh, monoidal structure of these categories. So on one side you can consider tensor product of J equivalent coherent sheaves, and that always carry a natural J equivalent structure. On the other side, you can consider tensor product of representations of, of this parabolic group P. And uh, uh, it also has a natural structure of a representation of P and uh, the equivalence commutes with these operations. And the same is true for the derived category, if you consider derived tensor products. And uh, these uh, equivalences uh, are very easy to construct and they are very uh, simple and useful. So, uh, namely, if you have, uh, so maybe let me write it here. So, if you have a G equivalent coherent sheet, uh, what you can do, you can associate to it uh, just the fiber of this coherent sheaf at, uh, at, at, the, uh, at the point of your homogeneous variety, which is stabilized by P. Yeah? So uh, th th this notation G mod P means that we have uh, a transitive action of the group G on our variety and P uh, is the stabilizer of a certain point. So F0 is just the point uh, stabilized by P. Uh, 
I hope you can see uh, the right side of the blackboard. Okay, so uh, the, the factor from the category of equivalent shifts to the category of representations associates uh, to a shift uh, its fiber at the, uh, at the distinguished point of G mod P. So this is very straightforward. And the opposite, uh, the factor that goes in the opposite direction is also quite simple. So imagine that we have a representation of the group P. Then what we can do, uh, we can take it to the following uh, vector bundle. So we take V, uh, we uh, take its uh, product with G, and we take the quotient uh, by the natural action of the group P that acts uh, on V, because this is a representation of P, and that also acts uh, on G by uh, multiplications. And uh, from this uh, quotient, there is a natural morphism to G mod P, and uh, uh, its fiber at this special point is just V, and this is a locally trivial vibration with fiber V, so this is a vector bundle. Uh, so I will denote this vector bundle by V underlined. Uh, okay, uh, and uh, it is um, completely straightforward to see, and this is a useful exercise. If you never did this, uh, uh, I recommend it very much. Uh, it is very straightforward to see that uh, these two functors are mutually inverse, uh, that they are compatible with a uh, monoidal structures and with the, uh, and uh, that these functors are exact. They take exact sequences to exact sequences. And uh, if you uh, consider the direct functors of these two, you obtain an equivalence of the uh, direct categories. So this is how it works. And uh, therefore, uh, the uh, theorem that we mentioned before, uh, that was saying that any exceptional object is G equivalent, just means that uh, any exceptional object has this form, that any E can be written as V underlined for some V, which is a representation of the representation of the parabolic. And therefore, if you want to construct uh, many exceptional objects uh, and uh, to, to construct an exceptional collection, what we need to understand, uh, so we, we need to be able to answer two questions uh, for representations of P. Uh, the first question is when the associated vector bundle is exceptional, and second, when uh, two such vector bundles are semi-orthogonal. So if we can answer these two questions, then uh, we can construct exceptional collections. Okay, so uh, how uh, can we do this? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, the good point about this is that uh, in some sense we reduced geometric problem about uh, some maybe not very simple variety like G mod P, like Grassmannian, or maybe symplectic or orthogonal Grassmannian, or maybe Grassmannian of some exceptional group, which is hard to, which may be hard to describe. Uh, we reduced it to a uh, more algebraic question about representations of the parabolic group. But we also need to translate uh, exceptionality and uh, semi-orthogonality properties into this uh, setting. So how to do this? Uh, the thing that makes your life not very easy from this point of view is the fact that uh, the group P is not reductive. P is not reductive. So it's representation theory uh, is complicated. But of course, uh, we can first concentrate on the reductive part of P. Uh, this means the following. So as any algebraic group, we can uh, 
as in any algebraic group, we can consider uh, the maximal unipotent uh, ideal in P. So let U in P be the unipotent radical. And let L be the quotient of E by this radical. Uh, this is a reductive group. Reductive algebraic group. And it is called Levy quotient. So, uh, by definition, we have an exact sequence. U goes to P, goes to N, goes to 1. And in fact, uh, this uh, sequence has a section, a uh, non canonical section. You can always choose it. And in fact, P is just, uh, by using this section, you can uh, write P as a, a semi direct product of, of this unipotent radical and that, and this Levy quotient. Okay, so uh, we can, uh, as I said, uh, the group the group P is not reductive, so this category is uh, not very simple. But we can consider uh, we can first restrict to the simple part of this category. So uh, let us say that the representation V is uh, red P is uh, semi-simple if uh, u acts on it linearly. So, of course, if, uh, if the group u acts linearly, this means that the action of e factors through the action of its Levy quotient and therefore, if we denote by red as, as P, the category, this, uh, the full subcategory of uh, semi simple representations of P, uh, this category is equivalent to the category of representations of the Levy quotient. Uh, and uh, this category is much better behaved because L is reductive, and therefore, this category. Uh, is a semi simple uh, abelian category. Uh, this means that uh, any object uh, uh, can be in a unique way written as a direct sum of multiplicities of irre irreducible objects, of simple objects. And um, yeah, so, um, and uh, also, these uh, simple objects uh, can be uh, classified, and so you can uh, have uh, very good ways to control this category. This category is really uh, very simple. Uh, yeah. Uh, maybe uh, let me give you some examples uh, of this situation. Uh, so, uh, for instance, uh, what happens when X is just the usual gas meaning? So, let me just mean it again. Uh, yeah, uh, as uh, we discussed yesterday, if we want to represent it uh, as a homogeneous space of a simply connected uh, simple algebraic group, then the group is uh, SLN. Uh, but uh, in fact, uh, in many cases, uh, at least in some cases, uh, it is more convenient uh, to replace a simple algebraic group by another reductive group, which has the same uh, uh, adjoint uh, simple group. So, uh, in, in fact, in this case, it is more convenient to consider 
uh, X is a homogeneous variety of the group JL. Uh, maybe I will uh, comment why it is more convenient a bit later. So, to think of X as yes, GLM, uh, GLM, modular, uh, a parabolic subgroup of uh, JLM. Uh, then uh, the corresponding parabolic uh, subgroup, uh, as we discussed yesterday, consists uh, just of uh, block upper triangular matrices. So this, this is P, so uh, this block has size K by K, and this block has size N minus K uh, by K, and so on. Yeah, and uh, the unipotent radical in this case corresponds to strictly upper triangular matrices. Uh, so we should put uh, identity matrices here and something here and zero here. So this is the unipotent radical, and the Levy group in this case is just the group of uh, block diagonal matrices. So if we take the quotient of this group by this group, uh, this is what we will have. And so it is isomorphic to GLK times GL n minus k. And uh, already at this point you can see why uh, this representation of X is more convenient than uh, uh, the representation as the quotient of SLN, just because uh, if we will consider this as a portion of SLN, then the Levy group uh, will not be split as a direct product of this form, but it will be just the intersection of this subgroup of GLN with SLN. And it, it is not a direct product anymore, so it's more complicated, and it is much more convenient uh, to work with a group of this sort. So, uh, uh, how can you describe representations of this group? Of course, uh, since the group is a product, representations of this group is just pairs of representations of the factors. So, yeah, yeah, in this example, is just the direct sum of the category of representations of GLP plus representations of GLM minus P. So to, to, to give a representation of L, we just need to give a pair. Uh, so maybe I should write tensor product. Okay, so a general uh, representation of L is just a tensor product of a representation of GLK and a representation of GL n minus k. So uh, to understand how these representations look like, we need to understand how representations of JLK look like. And this is a very classical story. So, um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, this category is semi-simple. So if we want to describe the category, it is just enough to explain what are the irreducible objects, what are irreducible representations of this group, because any other representation will be just a direct sum of this. And uh, in fact, irreducible representations of JLK, uh, they are classified, uh, so I will use notation VJLK, uh, to, to, this means that this is a representation of JLK, and they are classified by uh, highest weights of these representations, and highest weights are just, in this case, uh, are just non-increasing se sequences of integers. So lambda one, three, three, and then lambda two, and so on, up to lambda k. So um, so to, to, to specify a representation of JLK, we just need to specify a non-increasing sequence of k integers. The number of integers equals uh, to the Index in JLK. 
And um, I mean, uh, for instance, uh, um, the standard uh, representation uh, uh, corresponds to the sequence. I mean, uh, there are different conventions here. So, uh, and different people use different conventions. This is, of course, sometimes uh, can lead to confusions. Uh, so, uh, my convention is that the collection, uh, the highest weight. So, if, if I think of uh, GLK, so GLW for some uh, vector space W, then uh, for me, uh, the sequence 1, 0, 0, and so on, 0 corresponds to the re representation W dual. So this is the representation with this highest way. And for instance, uh, if you take sequence of this sort, if you start with P and then put zeros, then this corresponds to the symmetric uh, power of W dual. And if instead you consider a sequence of ones followed by a sequence of zeros, if, and if you take a uh, coordinates equal to one, this corresponds to, to the exterior power. And for instance, if you take all uh, entries to be one, this corresponds to the determinant of W dual. And uh, so that's uh, uh, how it works. And uh, if, if you take a general uh, 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 sequence of lambda, then essentially you need to take, consider the tensor product of several symmetric powers or several exterior powers, and then uh, just uh, uh, find uh, in this tensor product a direct sum end, um, an, an appropriate direct sum end. So um, such an irreducible representation can be realized as a particular direct sum end of a tensor product of symmetric and ex or of symmetric powers or exterior powers of the standard representation. Yeah, so maybe I should also say that uh, W itself corresponds to the sequence when we have uh, many zeros and one minus one. And in some sense, uh, this corresponds to the isomorphism that this is lambda k minus one w dual ends up that w because that w corresponds to a sequence of minus ones. And uh, this is a linear representation that tends a product with a determinant Response to adding uh, ones to all entries here. Okay, so this is how uh, the representation theory of the group JLK looks like. And now, uh, what are the corresponding vector bundles on the Grassmannian? So, uh, uh, in fact, this is also quite straightforward. So uh, if, if we consider the Grassmannian of k-dimensional subspaces in an uh, n-dimensional vector space, uh, then, uh, so maybe it, it was a bit choice to use W here. Let me correct it to V everywhere. I'm sorry. The good thing is that it is very easy to change W to V. Um, okay, so uh, so I assume that now we consider Grassmannian Km, and I will write it as Grassmannian Kw, and W will be a vector space of dimension n. So this is Grassmannian of k-dimensional subspaces in W. Then uh, this Grassmannian comes with a tautological vector bundle of k, which is naturally a subbundle in the trivial vector bundle with fiber W. So we have the tautological exact sequence. So this U stands for the tautological bundle. We have W tensor O here. And then uh, uh, after that, 
uh, we have the quotient bundle, which I will denote just W mod U for simplicity. So we have this tautological sequence. Uh, this is a vector bundle of rank K, and this is a vector bundle of rank N minus K. Of course, this exact sequence is uh, GLW equivalent. In particular, these two vector bundles are equivalent. And uh, uh, in fact, if we consider uh, a general uh, irreducible representation of our Levy group, so as I mentioned, it is a tensor product of a uh, representation of an irreducible representation of JLK and of irreducible representation of JLN minus K. So it can be written as VJLK lambda tensor VJLN minus K mu. Um, where lambda is a non-increasing sequence of k integers and mu is a non-increasing sequence of n minus k integers. And then uh, this corresponds to the vector bundle, uh, which uh, I will denote by uh, sigma lambda u dual tensor sigma u w mod u. Uh, where this sigma lambda and sigma mu is uh, is the notation for what is called uh, sure functors, and this is correspond. Uh, this is just uh, the application of of the equivalence between representations of of, of the group and equivalent vector bundles that we discussed. So these are sure functors. So in other words, uh, what is uh, sigma lambda of u dual? Uh, as we discussed, uh, this representation v lambda j k is a particular direct sum n uh, in the say tensor product of several symmetric uh, powers of v dual. Uh, we can consider the, the corresponding uh, tensor product of symmetric powers of u dual and then consider the direct sum which is defined in the same way as uh, for representations. So this, uh, this vector bundle is just a certain an appropriate direct sum in the tensor, in a tensor product of symmetric powers. And similarly here, this vector bundle is a direct sum in the tensor product of symmetric powers of W and U. So altogether, we obtain uh, a certain a uh, uh, vector bundle that corresponds to this irreducible representation. So this is how it looks in the case of, uh, of the usual gross minimum. Um, yeah, so for more complicated homogeneous varieties, uh, the story is a bit more complicated just because the Levy group is more complicated. Maybe let me say what happens uh, for the Uh, symplectic gross minimum k say 2n uh, in this case uh, we also have a description uh, of the parabolic and it is easy to see that in this case the Levy group is isomorphic to the product of j k and uh, symplectic group to n minus 2k. So if you want to uh, uh, to specify an irreducible representation of this group, so this second example, uh, then we need to specify a representation of j k and s p to n minus k, and therefore irreducible uh, equivalent vector bundles. Uh, on this Grassmannian have form uh, sigma lambda the dual tensor. So uh, here u is again the tautological rank k vector bundle. So this is completely similar to the previous story. And here we need uh, some symplectic vector bundle. And this symplectic 
bundling is in fact u pair mod u, where u pair is always defined as the dual of this vector bundle. So it is naturally a subbundle in W dual tensor O, but uh, since we have a symplectic form in W, W dual is identified with W, so U pair is a subbundle in W, and uh, the isotropic property implies that U is actually a subbundle in U pair, so we can consider this option bundle, and the symplectic form on W induces a symplectic form on this quotient bundle. And then we need to apply so-called symplectic uh, show functor to this symplectic vector bundle. So here mu will be the highest plane for the symplectic group, and we should apply a symplectic show functor, which is defined analogously to the usual uh, show functor. You just need to replace uh, representation theory of J with the representation theory of the symplectic group. Okay, so this is how equivalent, uh, how irreducible equivalent vector bundles on our homogeneous varieties look like. Now the question is how to compute X spaces between these vector bundles. So the main problem here is in fact the following. So we defined our vector bundles as objects of the equivalent derived category of X. But we are not interested in this category. Instead, we are interested in the usual derived category of X, right? Of course, we have uh, this uh, forgetful function here. So whenever we have an equivalent vector bundle, we can forget its uh, equivalent structure and just uh, concentrate on its vector bundle structure. And uh, similarly, for a complex, uh, for an object of the equivalent category, we can forget its equivalent structure and uh, we can consider it just, an, uh, just as an object of D of X. But the problem is that this functor is very far from being fully faithful. Uh, this functor is not, not at all fully faithful. So if you want to check uh, whether our exceptional uh, whether our equivalent vector bundle is exceptional or not in, in D of X, or whether two such bundles are semi orthogonal in D of X, we cannot do computations in DG of X. Of course, uh, the life would be much easier if we could do this, but this is not the case. So we really have to pass to the more complicated category D of X. But uh, in some sense, uh, to compute X spaces, we need to, I mean, a computation of X spaces in some sense has two steps. And in fact, one step we can still do in the equivalent category. And for the other step, we have a very uh, powerful computation tool. So uh, the life is complicated, but uh, not uh, over. So you can. You can still survive. Not too bad. So, uh, how do we compute X spaces between, say, assume that we have two uh, equivalent vector bundles? So, assume that we have E1, which is V1 underlined, and E2, which is V2 underlined, and assume that we want to compute X from E1 to E2. So how can you do this? Uh, you can uh, just rewrite this as the cohomology on X of E1 dual tensor E2, right? So this is the cohomology on X of V1 underlined dual tensor E2 underlined, right? Now we can use the fact that the equivalence of this category with the general category of representations of P was monoidal. So uh, this equivalence is compatible with the monoidal structure. So the two operations that we have here 
the duality operation and the tensor product operation are preserved by this equivalence. And this means that this is the same as the cohomology of the following character bundle. We should take V1 dual, just the dual representation of V1, tensor it with V2, just as representations of the parabolic group, and consider the corresponding equivalent vector bundle. So uh, this is uh, the good part of the story. So, and of course, uh, since I mean, if if V1 and V2 are semi-simple representations of P, in other words, if they are representations of the Lewis motion, then these operations uh, preserve uh, this property of being semi-simple and dualization and tensor product in this category are just the same as in this category. So uh, to, to compute this vector bundle, we just need to know how to tensor product uh, representations of L and how to dualize them. So need to know. How to dualize and multiply uh, reducible representations of L. I mean, when I say how to dualize and how to multiply, I mean that as we know, any representation of L is a direct sum of irreducibles. So we need to know uh, how irreducible summons change under dualization and how do they change under tensor pro. Uh, the, the first part of the story is very simple. So what is the dual of VL lambda? So it is again an irreducible representation uh, of the same group L uh, with another highest weight. And this new highest weight is the following. You should take what is called the longest element of the Y group of L and uh, act by this element on lambda and then take this uh, with a minus sign. Uh, so for instance, when L is just J and K times J and N minus K, as in the case of, of the Grassmannian, then, uh, I mean, maybe let me tell you just for JFK, uh, so if you take V lambda 1 and so on lambda k for JFK and take the dual, then uh, what we get will be JMK and the highest weight will be minus lambda k and so on minus lambda 1. So we should uh, uh, take the opposite order uh, ordering on this integral sequence and uh, we should take the opposite of this integral sequence. Uh, clearly if this sequence was uh, non-increasing then this sequence is also non-increasing. So and uh, there is a similar role for symplectic and other representations. So uh, this longest element in the white group is usually uh, very easy to write. So the dualization operation is quite simple. The tensor product operation is much more complicated. For instance, uh, for the case of the group JL, Then the product of uh, irreducible representations is described by the so called Littlewood Richardson rule. Richardson. Uh, it is a non-trivial combinatorial rule. 
uh, which uh, I mean you can easily find if you are interested in maybe uh, it, it is not particularly important how uh, it looks uh, precisely for our purposes. Let me just say that uh, uh, maybe I will explain it in, a, in the simplest particular case uh, just to give you a flavor of this rule. So uh, as we discussed, highest weights can be thought of as uh, non-increasing sequence of integers. So if uh, for, simplicity, uh, for simplicity we assume that all integers in such a sequence are non-negative and we can always achieve this by uh, tensoring with the determinant if necessary, then uh, we can uh, picture such a sequence by a young diagram. So we just uh, draw a diagram of this sort such that lambda one is the length of the top row, lambda two is the length of the second row and so on. Uh, and uh, the fact that this is a young diagram reflects the non-increasing property of the sequence. And uh, assuming we want to tensor product such a representation with a representation that corresponds to a single box. And the single box uh, by this row corresponds to the sequence 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, uh, which is just um, maybe the dual of the standard representation. Then uh, how do we do it? Actually, this will be a sum of Young diagrams obtained uh, from the, the original Young diagram by adding one box. And uh, of course, we have to add this box in a way uh, that keeps our Young diagram, uh, I mean, that, that preserves the property to be Young diagram. So for instance, in this example, we can add a box here or here or here or here or here. So we will have five options for adding a box to this Young diagram. So this will be, this standard product will be a direct sum of five summits. I mean, anyway, what I want to say is that the rule is combinatorial. Uh, it is not hard to describe. And for instance, you can, I mean, it, it is definitely algorithmic and you can find uh, various computer uh, packages that uh, can do this computation for you. Uh, for instance, you can do this in Sage and I'm pretty, uh, there was also uh, some computer program called Lee some time ago, I'm not sure whether it exists anymore. But I mean, uh, this is com completely algorithmic and uh, for computers, it, it is very easy. For humans, you have to work, uh, especially if you, I mean, to tensor product, uh, to, 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 to tensor with a simple young diagram like this, it is very straightforward, but if you want to tensor two huge Young diagrams, it will be a huge direct sum. There, there will be many sum ends. Some of them will come with multiplicity. So it will not be very easy to do uh, for a human, but still it's possible. Okay. Uh, so altogether, what I want to say is that uh, there is a completely explicit procedure that allows you to tensor product irreducible representations of L or of P and therefore irreducible equivalent vector bundles and to dualize them. So this part of the computation you can do in the equivalent category. Now the second step is to uh, learn how to compute the cohomology of a single irreducible vector bundle. So by using representation theory, you can rewrite this vector bundle as a direct sum of irreducible vector bundles and so the next next question is how to compute its cohomology. So assume we have something of this sort. And here there is, a, uh, there is an exact answer to this question, which is called Barrel Bot Weight Theory, which is a very useful computational uh, tool. So theory. What the uh, 
So um, it tells you the point. So assume that you want to compute this cohomology groups. Uh, then what you need to do is the following. So first, uh, you replace this highest weight lambda by the weight uh, lambda plus rho, where rho is just a particular very special weight of your reductive group L. It can be defined in two ways. One definition is that this is um, the sum of all fundamental weights of your group L. Uh, and another way is that this is not the sum of all uh, positive roots for your group L. But uh, I mean, uh, these are lead theoretic definitions. But uh, in general, this is a particular uh, quite simple way. For instance, for the group G and K, this way is just P, K minus one, and so on, one. So uh, in a sense, this is the simplest strictly decreasing sequence of integers. So this is what you need to do. So the first thing is just to add to your weight lambda, which was a non-increasing sequence of integers. Uh, uh, no, no, wait, uh, I forgot one step. Uh, maybe let me state this theory uh, for Grassmannian, for Grassmannian KN, and I will then explain what changes for our arbitrary homogeneous case. So remember that uh, uh, an equivalent vector bundle in this case was given by uh, two sequences of integers. Um, I will need this row for JLM. So let me change this. So uh, our vector bundle uh, was a tensor product of representation for JLK of an irreducible representation for JLK and an irreducible representation for JLN minus K, where lambda was a non-increasing sequence of K integers and mu was a non-increasing sequence of N minus K integers. Now, the first thing that we do, we uh, just uh, concatenate these two sequences. So we consider the sequence that consists of the first uh, first of the integers from the first sequence and then from the second. In general, this corresponds to just to just a canonical identification of the weight lattice of the Levy group and of the group G. So in general, uh, weight lattice of L equals the weight lattice of G. There is a canonical identification, and uh, they are, in fact, both of them are equal to the weight lattice of P, and uh, we have a morphism from P to L, the quotient morphism, and also the embedding into G, and these identifications are just given, given by pullbacks. Uh, with respect to the matrices, So we have a canonical identification of these lattices, which in the case of Grassmannian KM takes this simple form. You have two sequences of integers and you just concatenate them. Note that uh, the, the, the sequences you started with were non-increasing, but the, this concatenation need not to be non-increasing. Uh, at, at the point where the, the concatenation happened, you can have a different inequality. Now, what you do on the first step, you consider mu plus rho JLM. So you add n to the first entry, n minus one to the second entry, and so on, one to the last entry. And then you, uh, uh, so uh, this is an element of the weight lattice, and we have uh, the natural action of the wire group here. So we have the wild group of GLN that acts on this lattice. 
Now, the next, next question you ask is whether this weight is stabilized by some element of the wire group. If there is, if there exists an element in the wire group such that W applied to mu plus rho is mu plus rho. So, by the way, in the case of JLN, this is this group is just the symmetric group which acts on sequences of integers by permutations. So this condition just means that two entries of this sequence are identical. If two entries are identical, then the transposition of the corresponding entries stabilize this sequence. And if all entries are distinct, then of course any permutation, uh, no permutations stabilize. So uh, assume that there is uh, W which stabilizes this way, then the theorem tells you that the cohomology of this vector bundle of the of the corresponding vector bundle are just identically zero. So this is a very nice and simple case. So if you don't have uh, if, if, if your weight is stabilized by some permutation, if two coordinates are equal, then the cohomology just finish. And if this does not happen, uh, if all entries here are different, then there is a unique permutation such that W times mu plus, plus rho is a dominant. Um, in fact, it's strictly dominant, which means that the entries are strictly decreasing for JLN. Then, in this case, uh, what you do, I mean, in this case, the cohomology is also described, and uh, this is just uh, the irreducible representation of the group JLM or group G in the general case uh, with the highest weight W times mu plus rho minus rho. So you have to subtract rho back. So you you choose this. You find this. Uh, permutation that makes this sequence strictly decreasing. Then you subtract rho. Uh, after that, uh, the, 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 the sequence is still non-increasing. Of course, it may not be strictly decreasing, but anyway, it will be non-increasing. So this will be a highest weight of JLN. So you can consider the corresponding irreducible representation. And uh, there will be precisely one cohomology group which is non-zero. This cohomology group will be this representation, and it will sit in the cohomological degree equal to the length of this permutation. And the length of a permutation is just the number of disorders. So this is the precise answer in this particular example. And uh, uh, the general re recipe is just the same. Uh, you just have to replace the permutation group with a more general while group. And, but what you do is, is precisely the same. You find the element in the while group that makes your element strictly dominant. Uh, you apply it and then you subtract. And uh, the, the cohomology sits in this particular degree. Okay. So uh, anyway, what I want to say, yeah, yeah. And uh, again, uh, this procedure is completely algorithmic and it, it was also uh, implemented in various packages in Sage. I think also it was implemented. So if you're interested in compu computations of this sort, you can do them by hand or you can uh, use computers. Anyway, this is uh, completely uh, realistic. 
So, uh, and uh, definitely you can, uh, so for instance, you can write a computer program which will uh, try to go over all possible uh, highest weights and try to find an exceptional collection out of the corresponding uh, irreducible uh, equivalent vector bundles. Uh, of course, uh, you have to find some bound for highest weights, uh, some a priori bound, because in general, I mean, altogether, there is infinite number of all possible highest weights. So definitely a computer cannot uh, uh, check an infinite number of possibilities. But uh, anyway, I mean, uh, a priori, something of this sort is doable. Um, and for instance, uh, you can uh, do this explicitly in, in, in some small cases. Of course, if you consider some huge homogeneous variety, then you will have a problem with, uh, with the time your uh, program will work. So for, for big homogeneous varieties, it may be not so easy to, uh, to do this, this kind of thing. But the main problem is that in general, uh, semi-simple representations of E are not enough. The, it is not enough to consider only semi-simple representations. So, for instance, if you consider uh, uh, something like symplectic gross meaning M to N, then you can easily check that uh, there is at most, I mean, uh, the maximum exceptional collection uh, of irreducible equivalent vector, vector bundles in the of x has length uh, at most n times n plus one. So gross quadratic with n. But the expected length is 2 to the power n. So it grows exponentially. So if you start increasing your n, very soon you will arrive at the situation when uh, there is not enough to consider irreducible equivalent vector bundles. So you need to work with more general vector bundles, and it makes the story much more complicated. Okay, I guess I'm out of time. Yeah, my time is over, so let me stop here. Uh, that's thanks, Sasha. And uh, are there any questions? You have a question if you're looking at non um, semi stable bundles. So then you have a non-trivial representation of U. Right. Can you can you give a simple example so we get a, an idea of what that yeah, uh, sure. bundles arise in such a way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, let, let me give you the simplest example which works uh, for any homogeneous variety. So uh, let us consider the uh, omega one of X, the cotangent bundle of X. You know that uh, H1 of this vector bundle is non trivial. Right? Uh, so if, I mean, I, say it is C if, if X is uh, G mod P with P maximal parabola. Uh, in, in a more general situation, this is C to the power the Picard rank of C. And so uh, there is a, the canonical extension. And this is uh, 
uh, and and of course uh, I mean of course uh, the cotangent bundle is equivalent and this extension also has a natural equivalent structure and this is a uh, kind of simplest uh, uh, equivalent vector bundle which is not semi simple so the action of the unipotent uh, ra radical corresponds I mean the, this exact sequence corresponds to the uh, radical filtration on this uh, representation of P. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, uh, this is how it looks in general. Uh, for any representation of P, there is a canonical filtration uh, such that its quotients are uh, semi simple representations. So the unipotent radical acts on the quotients trivially. And so you can think of a general representation of P as of an iterated extension of semi-simple representations. And is there a way to um, is there a way to read off the, the semi-stable factors in the Hardanarism infiltration from the representation theory? Uh, I mean. Uh, why, why do you speak about harder Narasimhan filtration? I'm not sure that this is directly related to it. Are oh, you saying the semi-stable factors here are not? No, this no, is no. Not, this is not harder Narasimhan? Uh, maybe let me give you another uh, example. So let us consider the case when X is just the gross medium. Yeah, gross medium KW. Then we have this tautological exact sequence that we discussed before. Note that this sequence is also equivalent, right? So uh, this is an irreducible equivalent vector bundle, and this is an irreducible equivalent vector bundle. But uh, this vector bundle is not the direct sum of these two. So it is a non-trivial extension. And if you think uh, about this trivial vector bundle as about equivalent vector bundle, it is not a direct sum anymore, right? So uh, uh, this is a non-trivial representation of the parabolic group, uh, which does not split as the sum of this sub-representation and of this quotient representation. And uh, the corresponding filtration that we have here, it has nothing to do with the harder narasimhan filtration, right? Just because this, as an abstract vector bundle, it is trivial, so it doesn't have any harder Narasimhan filtration. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Thanks. Any further questions? Yes. Yeah, so um, when you use the borel val theorem to compute the the X groups there, um, and let's say you have some exceptional collection that you have constructed uh, of such equivariant vector bundles. Can you compute the mutation in terms of the uh, of the representation theory? If you have like two next to each other, you want to mutate them. Uh, I mean, uh, usually when you st start mutating, you you very fast. Uh, I mean, uh, very quickly your ve your vector bundles uh, will become uh, non semi simple. Right, just because a typical mutation looks like some representation of the group G and that some vector bundle maps to the other vector bundle, right? And uh, as we just discussed, a, rep a representation of G, if you consider it as a representation of, of the parabolic, is not semi simple. So, very fast, uh, this will become a non semi simple vector bundle. For instance, uh, this sequence, I mean, in, in the cases when uh, the shape of uh, differentials is exceptional, this sequence is, is also a mutation. So you see, and uh, it, it gives you a non uh, semi simple vector bundle right away. So, in, in some sense, uh, the, the, the problem with mutations is that. In, this is just the general uh, problem of representation theory of non semi simple uh, groups. So it, it, it's a bit 
I mean, it's more hard to, to describe representations of such groups. And, and that's it, yeah? So, uh, I mean, it, it, the question, of course, uh, reduces to the question of representation theory of, of the parabolic group, just because, as we discussed, the equivalence between uh, equivariant derived category and representations of P uh, works for derived categories as well. And so if you have a mutation sequence, uh, whenever you have a mutation sequence, it is always equivalent. So you can compute it in, in the category of representations of P, but the question is how are you going to describe representations of P? That's, that's the main problem. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's thank Sasha again, and uh, we will reconvene uh, in eight minutes at uh, 11.15. Okay, thank you.